right, everyone, welcome to today's Skill Up series session. I'm Emily Springer. I'm an academic trainer in the Center for Teaching and Learning. And I'm very excited to have one of our very own academic coaches here, our stats uh, gurus at the university, Rachel Brune. If anyone needs me, um, questions in the chat, we're happy to assist as time permits. And I know if Rachel has time, she will pause for questions as we go along. All right, Rachel. All right. Thanks, Emily. And welcome, everybody. Thank you guys so much for joining. Uh, I'm going to share my screen here so we can jump in. Hopefully you all are joining because you want to learn about how to choose statistical tests for your study, maybe for your assignments, um, whatever the case may be. And I'm hoping that the information that I can provide here will help you through that journey. Um, there's not really an easy way to say, oh, do this test, because there are so many questions to ask. And hopefully through this webinar, you're going to learn what those questions are. Um, so here you can kind of get an idea of the test that I'm hopefully um, going to try to work through. I have not practiced timing, so I'm going to try to move at a steady pace, but try to make sure that I'm providing enough details to give you information um, about these. You should be able to fill in the columns in your handout with the information on the slides and the information that I'm sharing um, on each of these different types of analyses. And hopefully there will be time at the end where if you have questions or things that you want me to clarify, um, we can get to those as well. Uh, depending on how things are pacing, I might also pause in between each thing um, in case there are questions on say t-tests and you don't wanna wait until after we've talked about everything else to ask a question about a t-test. So I'll try to pause in between them for questions as well. Thank you so much, Rachel. And I will say if we don't get through all of it, then we know what our next session will yeah. entail. Right, the rest of them. <laughs> All right, so we'll start with our t-test family. Um, so the first one, there is an independent samples t-test. So in any t-test, we are comparing two groups to each other. For the independent samples t-test, that means we're pairing two groups that are unrelated to each other. Um, essentially meaning that each participant only belongs to one of these groups and there is no relationship or connection between individuals in the groups. Um, this could be like grouping people as male, female, doctor, lawyer, just two unrelated groups of people. Um, so when we're looking at, is this the right test? We're gonna look at our variables. So in a T test, we have an independent variable and a dependent variable. Our independent variable is our grouping variable. So it's gonna be an independent variable with two levels. So if we want it to be old school, we would go with the old school idea of gender and say male and female would be those two levels. If you wanted to be more modern with your gender options, you would need a different test. We'll talk about that one later. Um, but if whatever our grouping variable is, it needs only two categories. And this could even be something as simple as um, yes, no. Or if you're doing more of like a quasi-experimental or an experimental study, this could even be treatment and control. Now, when it comes to the variable in that case, I typically just say like treatment condition. <laughs> they were in the treatment or they were in the control. So it's still two levels of that one variable. I get a lot of students that say that they have two variables. It's one variable, but it has two levels. So we're dividing people into groups on that one variable. The dependent variable is what we would classify as continuous. Um, this would be numerical in nature. If you're not familiar with the different levels of measurement, nominal, ordinal, interval ratio, um, I definitely encourage you to check out the charts and variables group session that's offered in the Academic Success Center. Um, it's on Thursdays at 11 a.m. Pacific time. I know because I host it. <laughs> um, but we will talk about those levels of measurement. So if you don't know what a continuous variable is, you can learn what that is there. Um, so other things to consider, like I mentioned, the groups have to be unrelated. 
So there can't be a, any connection between people in the groups. Um, and that, I think that'll be more clear when I talk about the dependent t-test. Um, homogeneity of variances, without getting too fancy on that, this is an assumption of the test. So if you do this test, you would have to test this assumption. Basically, it's just saying the variability in each of your groups is similar. And then the dependent variable, that's what DV stands for, the dependent variable is normally distributed for each group. So if I had group A and group B, whatever my continuous variable is for these groups, I'm going to test to see if it is normally distributed for each group. So not just by itself, but based on grouping. Okay. And I guess I'll touch on the goal in case you didn't read it. Um, so when we have any t-test, we're, we're testing for differences between groups. And this is important because typically that's like the first step you're going to take when you're trying to determine your tests um, is determine if you're looking at differences or relationships. Um, so in a t-test, we are looking to see if these two groups are different from each other. So then we have our dependent samples t-test. Sometimes this is also called um, paired samples. Uh, this could also be called like a repeated measures t-test. Um, the idea is, is that the two groups that we're looking at are related. Um, again, we're still looking to see if there are differences between those groups. However, if it, it's like paired samples, um, that means that the people in each group have some connection. So this would be like if you're trying to look at studies, maybe you're looking at spouses. Um, so you would have one spouse in group A and one spouse in group B. Now, obviously, I don't care if spouse one has any sort of connection to spouse 10 because they're not spouses with each other, right? Um, so that's why it's paired. I'm specifically pairing spouse one in group A with spouse one in group B because they're together. Um, so that's where the paired idea comes from. Um, the other would just be if like a repeated measure. So this would be like a pretest, post test sort of design where you're going to give some measure, maybe introduce a treatment, and then do that same measure again to see if that treatment or that intervention created some sort of a change from point A to point B. Since you have the same people in both groups, that is a dependent samples t-test. Um, same variables apply. We have an independent variable with two groups and a continuous dependent variable. As I've kind of explained with the two different groups, that might look a little bit different um, than our independent samples because we could have our groups just be the pretest group and the post-test group. Again, those would be the same people in each group, but we have a pretest measure and a post-test measure. Hopefully that's clear. Um, and then in this case, we talked about with the independent samples that the dependent variable for both groups needed to be normally distributed. In this case, since we're looking to see if there was basically a significant change from one group to the other group, we're actually looking at the differences. Um, so rather than looking at the distribution of the dependent variables themselves, we're gonna compute the difference between the two groups and then look to see if those differences are normally distributed. Okay, so before I go on to talk about ANOVAs, I wanna pause. Are there any poignant questions about t-tests? No questions, yeah, about the t-test, but someone does want to know um, if the um, PDF uh, version PowerPoint would be available at the end. Um, I absolutely could turn it into a PDF and send that to Emily to send out. Okay, I'm happy to do no, that. I don't already have it in that version, but it's quick. Yeah, absolutely. Um, thank you so much. And next time I'll ask you ahead of time instead of putting me on the spot. Uh, okay, Patrick, um, do you want to unmute and ask your and ask this question here, or I can read it off for you? Yeah, um, I can. Yeah, just on, on mute. Are you hearing me? Yes. Um, Rachel, I'm somewhat confused by that IV. Now, I I see people saying that the IV is at the group level, right? And, right. 
Uh, mm -hmm. We didn't see, I thought the IBDV was at the, let's say, I'm investing um, funding at, against uh, graduation rates. For two groups, right? Performing schools and non performing schools, right? I rationalize that. Oh, Patrick, I'm so sorry. I'm having a hard time hearing him. I'm not sure if the sound was going in and out too. Mm -hmm. um, Patrick, I'm so sorry to interrupt you, but yeah. I want to make sure I'll read this on the chat and we'll see if yeah. this is better. Okay. okay. IV variable is somewhat confusing. You mentioned that IV is at group level. I thought the IV was one of the variable being regressed against the other variable. Hmm. So there is a regression analysis. Um, now, my um, language is not mine. Uh, ask, ask anybody. Numbers, not words for me. Um, so I honestly will tell you, I don't know um, as far as regressing it against another variable. Um, I understand it as being a grouping variable. It's the variable that tells me which group my participants belong in, and I can only have two groups for them to belong in. And I'm comparing these two groups to each other in my t-test in order to determine if they are different. Yeah. If I might, if I can add a little bit on it, if you can hear me, uh, to be specific, I'm looking at how funding affects graduation rates in performing and not in schools. Now, the two groups that I have are performing schools and non-performing schools. And we focus in on non-performing schools, but I'm contrasting it with performing schools. Now, in either school, there, there is funding being done, right? right? So when I'm writing up my, my proposal, I am identifying the IV as being funded and the dependent variable as graduation rate. But you said that both types of schools get funding, right? Yes, yes, but, you know, both states fund them. So I was, I was on board with you um, when you were talking about comparing the performance schools and non-performance performance schools. I can see that as two groups. Um, but since the funding is not changing, unless you're comparing funding with not funding, and then also considering whether it was a performance school and not a performance school, um, unless there's a change in the funding status, whether or not they receive funding, funding's not a variable because it's not changing, it's constant. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't think, based on what I understood, I don't think that funding would be um, a constant. But if you have questions about determining your variables, like I said, you can attend the charts and variables group session on Thursday. And we mm -hmm. talk about independent and dependent and things like that. Um, okay. If you go to the Academic Success Center, we could also schedule you for an individual session where you could talk about your design and your study with a coach and they could help you with teasing out the details. And I think, okay. and thank you, okay. Patrick, for bringing that up. And I would like to, I'm going to mute you, Patrick, just so we can move on to the next piece of the presentation. But as Rachel uh, mentions, I'm going to pop in the chat some of the links to the Academic um, Success Center for coaching. And then I'll also pop in the calendar as well, too. In terms of a folks' specific research design ideas, it's really going to be best to bring that those questions to the coaching sessions. All Perfect. right, Rachel. All right, so just like our t-tests, we have multiple types of ANOVAs. So I'm going to stick with just the ANOVAs, which is analysis of variance. Um, and then I'll talk about some more tests in this family. Um, so we're going to start with the simplest one, which is a one-way ANOVA. Similar to a t-test, the purpose here is to determine if our groups are significantly different from each other on some continuous measure. So again, we have one independent variable. It is still categorical, meaning it's still telling me what group people belong in. Mm 
and we have one continuous dependent variable, just like with our t-test. Um, the biggest difference here is essentially an ANOVA is allowing me to do multiple t-tests at the same time. So we use an ANOVA when we're doing more than two groups. So I talked about old fashioned gender. Now let's talk about maybe using gender in a more modern way. So we could be super simple and say male, female, non-binary or other or unspecified, right? Or we could provide multiple options like transgender or something along those lines. In this case, it doesn't matter how many different gender identities we want to provide. Um, each one of those is its own group and the ANOVA can accommodate however many groups I need to have. Um, so if we have a classifying variable like that, we could use the ANOVA. Like I said, it's doing the same thing that our t-test did, but it's allowing us to compare multiple groups at the same time. It carries the same assumptions as some of the other tests, meaning our groups have to be unrelated. So people can only belong to one group. We do still need that homogeneity of variances. So the variability within each group needs to be roughly the same. And the dependent variable needs to be normally distributed for each group. And that's important. Again, I don't want to evaluate normality for the variable itself. I need to ev evaluate the normality for each group of people. Um, and I'm not going to get into what happens if those are not met. <laughs> we do have other group sessions that talk more about some of these tests. So if you're like, oh, that's the test I need, join that group. So then we have two-way or factorial ANOVAs. Um, I'm not going to go into too much detail about the difference between two-way versus factorial. Um, basically, the biggest difference between the one-way and the two-way or the factorial ANOVA is that now we have two independent variables. Um, so I'm actually going to use the example that we were just talking about. Uh, where we were talking about funding or no funding versus um, the performance school and not performance school. Those will be two independent variables um, that are both classifying variables. So if I wanted to consider both of those factors on, I think you said graduation rates. Um, so if I was considering both of those variables as being a factor for graduation rate, I could do a two-way ANOVA because I would have one variable being, are they receiving funding? Yes, no, that creates two groups. And then are they a performance school? Yes, no, which creates another two groups. Um, so I would have four groups at the end with each school falling into one of those four groups. And then I would be able to compare. Um, again, our groups should be unrelated to each other. We need that homogeneity of variances within the groups and our dependent variable still needs to be normally distributed for each group. So the biggest difference, one-way ANOVA, we're building off of a t-test, we can now look at more than two groups. Our two-way ANOVA, we're building on that and now we can look at two independent variables instead of just one. And then we have a repeated measures ANOVA. The repeated measures ANOVA is like the dependent t-test. And I talked about um, dependent, one of the ways that we could do that would be with a pretest post test, like a repeated measure. Um, that's what this is. So a repeated measures ANOVA, we're gonna use that when we're looking at some continuous variable at multiple points in time. Um, so more than just pretest post test. Um, this makes me think of one of the things I did in my psychology program where we had to like memorize words and we did like an immediate recall. So what words do you remember immediately after learning them? And then we did like a one minute recall. So one minute later, how many words do you remember? And then we did five minutes later, how many words do you remember? So we assessed our recall of those words at three different points in time. This is repeated measures. It's the same group of people providing the same measure multiple times. Um, so we have one independent variable, and this is that repeated measure. So some people don't actually call it a variable. 
for conceptualizing. I think it's fine to call it a variable. Really, it's time and time is not a variable, um, but it's just that repeated component. So how many times did you repeat the measure? That's your independent variable. And then the continuous variable is your dependent variable. Were you saying something, Emily? I was, and then I was gonna apologize for interrupting you, sorry. Um, I just wanna make sure I can get to this and forgive me, I am multitasking with PDFs and, and uh, calendar sessions, but is there any way you could just expand or clarify or just repeat one more time um, the homogeneity of uh, variance concept? It's the idea that the variability, um, so, if you have if you have a continuous measure, um, so we'll use like age. If I have a group of 100 people, let's say the average age of those 100 people is 25. That doesn't mean that everybody in that room is 25. It doesn't mean half the people in that room are 25. It just means that on average, they're 25. So about that central measure, there's variability. There, there's variety um, in the ages. And what I'm looking for with homogeneity of variance is that variety is similar for each group. Does that help? And I know it'll take a minute for them to respond in chat. Yes. Um, so in the repeated measures ANOVA, um, the same concepts are there. Um, rather than calling it homogeneity of variance, we call it sphericity. Um, again, same idea that the variances or that variability for those groups is the same. So the variability across time is the same for repeated measures ANOVA. And again, we have group sessions that focus on these different test families. So if you're not familiar with some of these concepts, um, I definitely encourage you to join some of those sessions where you can learn more about it. And I have resources that I will have up on the slide at the end um that you can reference as well thank you rachel it did address that appreciate it perfect okay so that is the end of the anovas um next is manovas you'll notice it's exactly like anova except there's an m and this means multiple and so this idea is going to be very similar to what we just talked about the biggest difference um, if you remember with the anovas we had one dependent variable so with the one-way ANOVA, we had one independent, one dependent. If we called that a one-way MANOVA, we have one independent variable and at least two dependent variables. Um, so take any of those ANOVA tests that I just talked about, throw in some more dependent variables, and you've made it a MANOVA. Um, so I didn't, I'm not gonna elaborate on each one of these because it's the same idea. The only difference is we now have multiple dependent variables. Um, they still have to be continuous. And then the ANCOVAs, and you'll notice it says including MANCOVAs because the ANOVA family is really big. <laughs> um, so when we add the C, that stands for covariance. So now we're looking at covariance as well as just our independent and dependent variables. If we add the M in front of that, it's multiple analysis of covariation. Um, so again, multiple dependent variables. I get it's starting to get complex. Um, and that's why I am not covering this in great detail, um, but just giving you an idea of the things that we're considering here. So again, the number of variables that we have in our analysis, the level of measurement of those variables in the analysis, um, that's gonna help guide us. And then of course that goal. So, so far we've talked about tests where the goal is to identify differences between groups. Um, and so that's what all of these have been doing to some extent in increasing complexity. Um, again, if you, if you're considering any of these um, MANOVA and COVA tests, um, definitely reach out to us and we can get you scheduled for an individual session where you can get some more individualized support with these analyses because they are a little bit more complex. Um, but hopefully this gives you a good idea about tests where you're trying to compare groups for differences. 
And I kind of want to pause here because we're getting ready to start the other side of the test family that has a completely different purpose. So I want I want to make sure that we kind of give our brain a break here. So we we understand that we're moving away from comparing groups for differences and we're going to move on to something else. So are there any questions related to what I just talked about with these tests? Indeed, with these tests, the ANCOVA and the MANCOVA and the other ones that you covered right before this, mm -hmm. are these all for normal distributions only? Uh, and then it says no skew question mark. Correct. Um, with almost all parametric tests, um, they have an assumption that your continuous measure is uh, normally distributed technically approximately normally distributed, which means it doesn't have to be perfect. Um, there are ways of assessing normality and determining um, if it's normal or not. There are really fancy ways of transforming um, skewed data to make the transformed values normally distributed so you can use the transformed values. Again, I won't get into it, but yes. Um, Thus far, all of these tests um, do have to have normal distributions. Thank you for that, Rachel. One other question. I did pop the academic success uh, calendar in the chat um, mm -hmm. for the group sessions. Um, and then Jason had a question in the chat in correspondence to that, that I'm just gonna read it off. I do not see any group sessions on the calendars about specific tests. I only see ones that are SPSS. Is that the same session? I need to uh, learn more about specific tests before getting into the SPSS step. Just curious. Yes, so the tests are covered um, in relation to teaching those tests through SPSS. Um, depending on who is attending the session. The session is going to vary. Um, so it really pieces together all of it because it talks about the assumptions of the test. So you get familiar with those and how to test those assumptions. Now, if you're kind of still in the exploratory phase and you're trying to um, identify tests, um, then it might be better to do an individual session um, where you could talk about some of the concepts and um, sort of have that back and forth to help you brainstorm and see what tests might be appropriate. Um, in the resources that I'm providing, um, one of them is also an interactive guide to help you kind of work through like a, a virtual flowchart in choosing an appropriate test. Um, so that might be an alternative as well. Um, and then other resources, I'm pretty sure one of the ones that I have posted is like Sage Research Methods. Um, it's a really great place to locate resources to help you learn more about specific tests. So if you're just looking to further your understanding of specific analyses, um, some of those resources might be better. All right. Thank you so much, Rachel. And then, well, we have time for one more before we move on. Wendy, I see okay. your hand is raised. Hi. Yes, thank you. Uh, with regard to the ANCOVA and ANCOVA tests, when when you say it needs to have one or more covariables, would the covariable be different and separate from either the dependent or independent variables, or to be something? It would be something in addition to the the independent and dependent variables. Right. Um, in the analysis, it will take on a similar role as an independent variable. Um, so the biggest difference is on the interpretation side. So if you have a covariable in an analysis, it's because you know that this covariable is going to influence your dependent variable. And what you're trying to do is isolate the effect of the independent variable or variables. Um, so essentially what you do is you do the analysis with and without the covariable, so you can show the difference in the effect. So say basically, kind of like controlling for that covariable. So saying, okay, here's the change that we would see as a result of the covariable, which we knew would happen because we know this variable is going to influence our dependent variable. But on top of that effect, we also see a greater effect when we include our independent variable, thus suggesting that our independent variable is having a significant impact on that dependent variable over and above that of the covariable. Okay, thank you. And that is it for right now, Rachel. I know we want to try to move All right. to the next piece.
So we're going to shift now. We're moving away from groups. Groups don't matter um, at this point. They will come back up in a minute. Um, but right now for the next few tests, um, we're shifting into relationships. So looking at variables, not groups, and looking to see if those variables are related to each other or if they're independent from each other. Um, the simplest of these are correlations. So we're measuring the relationship between two variables. Essentially, as one variable goes up, what happens to the other variable? Does it go up? Does it go down? How consistent is that? Um, that's what we're trying to measure. So there are no independent or dependent variables. And I always kind of explain that using multiplication. So if I took two times three, I would get six. If I took three times two, I still get six. It doesn't matter what order those numbers are in, I'm gonna get the same result because the relationship goes both ways. Correlation works the same way. It doesn't matter if I'm correlating A with B or B with A, that relationship is the same. So I can't say that, you know, one's an independent and one's a dependent because I don't know. Um, so there are no independent or dependent variables in a simple correlation analysis. We can only compare two variables at a time. Now, that doesn't mean that we couldn't include more variables in the analysis. But what we'll end up with is a two by two table. So um, we'll have all of our variables going up and down and all of those variables going side to side. And then we just start pairing them up. So every single variable gets correlated with every other variable in this matrix. Um, so we're only comparing two variables together at a time, regardless of how many variables we plug into the analysis at the same time. Hopefully that makes sense. Um, there are different types of correlation analyses. Two popular ones, um, Pearson correlation specifically requires that our variables are continuous. So if they are any other level of measurement, we could not use a Pearson. It also requires that our data is paired. And what I mean by that is kind of like with our paired samples t-test where we looked at spouse one and spouse one in both groups because they're spouses together. We need those two in order to make our comparison there. The same idea here, um, if I was looking at temperature and ice cream sales, I need to know the temperature in the same place as the ice cream sales. Um, it doesn't matter to just know some temperature numbers and some ice cream sales and say, are they related? It matters that temperature is paired with its ice cream sales all the way through the analysis. So our data has to be related to each other in that sense. It also assumes that our data has a linear relationship, meaning that it kind of forms a line. Um, and I say kind of because it's not gonna look like a line, um, but it says in our relationship, if we plotted it on a graph, it doesn't go woo, it just makes a line some way, shape or form. Um, how linear it looks will reflect the strength of the relationship, but it can't change direction. It needs to move in one direction and one direction only. If any of those are violated, you can't do a Pearson. Um, Spearman is another popular one. Um, this one is for ordinal data. So data that's like ranked. Um, again, the data does still need to be paired in order for you to have meaningful relationship analyses there. Um, there are other types of correlation, like a point by serial, which has to do with um, a continuous and a bivariate. Um, so the variable only has two outcomes, um, things like that. Building on a correlation, um, we have our regression analyses. So a simple linear regression um, really isn't that much different than a correlation. The biggest difference is, is so that sorry. you're creating... Go ahead. Oh, so sorry, Rachel. I just want to make sure because I know you like to do the sections. Someone just mentioned, could you please repeat this, the Spearman, please? You could just have you say it one more time. Yeah. So with a Spearman correlation, our variables must be ordinal. Um, so as opposed to continuous, meaning our variables are ranked 
So they're not numerical in nature, but they do belong in a specific order. Um, so this could be something like those liquor type items where it's like one is strongly disagree, seven is strongly agree, and then everything in between. Um, so if they're ranked like that, uh, you would use a Spearman. And as I talked about when we're measuring this relationship, what we're looking at is as I change one variable, move it up, move it down, what happens to the other variable? Does it move up? Does it move down? So that conceptualization means that we have to have that order, right? If it's if it's just co favorite colors, as I change favorite color, what happens? Well, I don't know because the color doesn't move up and down, right? Um, so we we have to have at least ordered variables. Um, so with ordinal, we would go with Spearman. Uh, the data does still need to be paired, meaning I have to have two points from the same source compared together. Thank you so much, Rachel. I didn't mean to interrupt you, but I was like, oh, I want to make sure I get to that. So everyone's brain was still on it. So, um, so the simple linear regression um, really isn't that different from a correlation. Um, we have one independent variable and it has to be continuous. And we have one dependent variable that also has to be continuous. So you remember that's similar to our Pearson requirements. Um, our independent variable, typically we no longer call it an independent variable. Um, National University likes it when we call it a predictor variable. Um, our dependent variable also gets renamed as a criterion variable or an outcome variable. It's the same ideas as independent and dependent. They just decided they couldn't use the same words. Um, but in this case, you'll notice that we took the variables and we've assigned them independent and dependent or predictor and criterion. Um, so technically we could still switch those variables and do this analysis because that relationship goes both ways. So what you identify as being a predictor and what you identify as being an outcome really depends on your study and what you think that relationship looks like. Um, I think this is a really great time to point out a common phrase, correlation does not equal causation. So whereas with our other tests, when we were talking about the effect, when we were looking at differences between groups, um, I could say that changing one variable had an effect on the other variable. When we start looking at these regression analyses, I can't really make that claim because like I said, I could flip the variables. It would work the other way too. Um, it's just that I've chosen to treat one as a predictor and the other as the outcome. Um, so we cannot make causal statements if we're doing a regression analysis. I can't say that changing the temperature caused my ice cream sales to change. I can say that as I raise, as the temperatures went up, uh, my ice cream sales also went up. I can say that. I can't ex explain why, and I can't say that it cost it. Um, but what we're doing with this regression, more than a correlation, because the correlation, I would just have to stop there. I would just be able to say um, that as I increase the temperature, ice cream sales increases as well, and that's all I can say. With regression, what we're really trying to do is create a predictive model. So I mentioned that those relationships have to be linear. Regression capitalizes on that linear model. Using the line as um, a, a model for our data. So if I have data from say January to June, I could use that data to create a model to predict what my sales will be in other months based on the temperature in those months. So I've now kind of made a real world application of that simple correlation. Um, so I talked about still needing that linear relationship. Um, we need homoscedasticity. Don't worry, you can fumble over that word. Um, that's still that idea of variances, um, but now we're talking about error variances. Um, I'm not going to get into that too much. It relates to these residuals. Again, that idea that that line um, is averaging my data because my data is not going to form a perfect line. But in order to create a model, I need a perfect line. So essentially, we're 
compromising the data to create a perfect line, which means our line is subject to error. And those errors have assumptions that need to be met in order to do this analysis. Um, building off of that, we have a multiple linear regression. The only difference here is now instead of just one independent variable, we can have two or more. And we no longer have a requirement that that variable must be continuous. Um, so now our independent variable could also be nominal or ordinal, or it could be interval or ratio, it doesn't matter. Um, if you have a categorical variable with multiple categories, you will have to create dummy variables, won't get complicated on it. If you find yourself in that position, we can definitely help you with it. Um, but the important takeaway is that you do not have that requirement that those independent variables are continuous if you're doing a multiple regression. The overall purpose is still the same. I'm gonna create a predictive model, but now my model is accounting for more factors or more predictors. So rather than just saying, well, temperature might influence ice cream sales, maybe I'm also gonna look at geographic region. So maybe where in the US we're located, as well as the temperature in that region also is going to affect our ice cream sales. So we can now start to consider more factors and how each of those factors impact this model and our ability to predict that outcome with some degree of accuracy. Um, it does require that there is a linear relationship between the dependent variable and each of those independent variables. Still have that requirement of homoscedasticity. Um, the residuals still have to be normal, normally distributed. The new assumption that gets added here is multicollinearity. Simple version, my predictor variables cannot be strongly correlated with each other because if they are, then there's a really good argument that they're just measuring the same thing. And maybe I don't need one of those variables in my analysis because it's not adding anything to it. Um, so we do need to consider that as well. That is the last regression one that I'm gonna talk about. Again, there are other regressions like ordinal logistic regression and things like that um, has to do with the dependent variable no longer being continuous. Um, and then there are regressions when you have a dichotomous outcome, uh, things like that. So there, there are other types of regression. Um, and if I tried to go over all of them, we would not cover all of them. There are too many. Um, so these are the popular ones. <laughs> Thank you, Rachel. Questions about regression. Yeah, Wendy, you got a question about regression. I do, thank you. So, would we start with a correlation analysis? And then if we found a statistically significant correlation, go on with that same data to a simple linear regression, for example? Typically, no. Um, you'll be, you'll, as part of a regression analysis, you can assess if there was a significant relationship mostly because if there was a significant correlation, you will also have a significant regression because a simple linear regression, like I said, it's not really doing anything different than the correlation other than it's creating a predictive model out of the relationship. So the measures that we look at, so every test has a measure of effect size. The effect size is exactly the same as the correlation effect size between those two variables. So if there is a significant correlation, you will also have a significant regression model. The only difference is if you're doing a multiple linear regression because now you're considering multiple variables in the analysis. So typically, you're only gonna do one test for every hypothesis pair that you have. So if your hypothesis relates to just the relationship between variables, you're doing a correlation. If your hypothesis is about the predictability, then you're doing a regression. So you wouldn't do both. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay, I have another question. Um, somebody said thank you so much for this simplified uh, presentation, but they all need an individual session. I said me too. I start stats next month. Okay, so here we go. Um, this question in the chat, Rachel, 
Mm -hmm. If you create a multiple linear regression and find out during the analysis that one of your predictor variables violates the multipolarity, I'm oof, stumbled over that one. What do you do? Drop that variable? Typically, yes. Um, there's different ways to handle assumption violations. Um, and part of it's going to depend on to what extent is it violated. Um, sometimes if it's just barely, you might keep it in because it's still making a meaningful, separate, distinct contribution. Um, but most of the times you would just choose one of the variables. And what I often see is that they'll present the results. Um, they'll run it once with all the variables in play and then run it again without it. And basically just look at the two models and are they different from each other? If yes. Um, then they'll they'll go with the one that has the most significance. Um, if they're not different, then obviously that multicollinearity did not have a meaningful impact on the model. So it's a non-factor and they can use whichever model they want. Um, so if you find yourself in that position, um, you'll probably consider both models and then use that to help you determine exactly how you want to handle the multicollinearity. Um, jo Jody says, thank you. Perfect. Um, no other questions in the chat right now. I know we have about 10 more minutes, Rachel. Okay. So I think this is the last test family that I'm going to talk about because I did not talk about very many non-parametrics. Um, so chi-square, I told you we were going to come back to groups. We are coming back to groups now. However, we are not looking for differences. Um, so we're still keeping with that idea of relationships, um, looking to see if two things are related or dependent. Um, but now we are looking at groups. Um, so what we're looking at here for a goodness of fit test, we have one independent variable. That independent variable is measured on a categorical level. So it's um, nominal or ordinal. And what we're looking at is, are my participants, how they're distributed in those groups, is that different than some expectation. So this expectation could be that there's an equal. So um, if we wanted to look at um, do kindergartners have a color preference, this means that the null hypothesis would be that there is no color preference, meaning there's roughly the same number of kids with each color as their favorite color. So I would compare the number of kids with each color to that assumption that there's even number of kids and see if there's a difference. If there is a difference that indicates that one of those groups, at least, um, had a lot more kids in it than we would expect to see if there was an equal preference for colors. Um, so there is no dependent variable here. What we're looking at is the number of people in each group. So we're looking at how people are distributed throughout the groups. Um, we could also, instead of saying all are equal as our null hypothesis or our comparative, um, we could also have, um, so in my high school stats class, we, we did a lot with um, like M&Ms and stuff. And M&Ms, if you go on their website, they have like a breakdown of how, like on average, what percentage are brown, what percentage are blue, what percentage are green, et cetera, right? Um, but within each individual bag, we know that each bag doesn't always fit that distribution. So we could also use this goodness of fit to compare that. So maybe it's, you know, 30% brown, 10% blue, right? So it's not even for each color. We can actually compare the distribution, say, in an individual bag to the distribution that M&M's says it provides in its M&M candies and see if our bag is significantly different than what m ms says we should expect. Um, so there are some things to consider. Um, one being that you have to have at least five people um, in each of those categories. So if I did say the shirts and I only had, um, if I had a really low expected count where one of those colors or yeah, one of those colors had fewer than five people, um, we would need to reconsider how we're assigning our groups in order to ensure that there's at least five people in each group. We also need to ensure that our groups are mutually exclusive. And what that means is that you can't be in two groups at once. So 
you know, like with my M&M colors. Blue is definitely different from brown. It's not possible to be in blue and brown at the same time. M&Ms are only one color. Um, but if we had, um, you know, some of those candies that have two different colors, it wouldn't work because the candy has two colors on it. It could belong to two groups. Um, so we need to make sure that each group is separate from the other. And then the other chi-square test is the test for independence. Sometimes it's also called the test of association. It's talking about the same thing, and it's looking at that relationship between two categorical variables. Um, so again, we have two independent variables. These are categorical. Each of these variables has at least two levels, meaning we're classifying people into two groups. Um, so uh, one, one that I see a lot has to do with a lie detector test. So one of the variables would be, did the person lie? Yes or no? So that's one variable, did they lie? And the levels or the groups there are, yes, they lied, no, they didn't. And then we could have another variable, and this would be what the lie detector test said was the outcome. So based on the lie detector, did they lie? Yes or no? And that's what the lie detector said. Um, so again, kind of you remember back to the two-way ANOVA where we were classifying people in the same way, um, we end up with four groups with each person belonging to exactly one group. So yes, they lied. Yes, the lie detector said they lied. Or yes, they lied. And the lie detector said, no, they didn't lie, right? We're pairing those two variables and each person has exactly one of the pairs. I hope that makes sense. It's so much better with the visual, I promise. Um, so we have these two variables. And again, it's going off of the assumption that um, there is some expected distribution of how people should fall. And we're comparing the numbers that we actually got. So how people were actually distributed amongst those groups compared to how we would expect them to be distributed. In this case, we're looking at um, if these groups are independent. So if lying is independent of the lie detector's outcome of saying you lied or didn't lie. If those two things are independent, not related, um, then we have our expected outcomes, our results will be not significant. But if there is a relationship, which there is, we would have significant outcomes. Um, so we're saying that because our distribution was different than what we expected, that means that there is a relationship between these variables. And we still have those same requirements of five people per group and groups being mutually exclusive. That's the last one that I was going to talk about. So I will open it up for questions. While we're doing questions, I'm gonna throw these resources up. Yes, um, thank you. Okay, a couple of folks have asked about whether or not they can have a copy of the presentation. We will absolutely send yeah. everybody who's registered a copy of this session and I can get a PDF from Rachel as well too. So um, let me go up to two questions that I can see here in the chat. Let me see. Oh, sorry, lost it for a second. Okay. Can you kindly please repeat the chi-squared prerequisites, especially the independent variable and the dependent variable, if you don't mind? So there is no dependent variable um, in either chi-square test. Um, so we only have independent variables. There is the goodness of fit, which will only have one independent variable. And that variable will have multiple groups. And it could be as few as like three groups or as many as 10 groups. Um, you know, doesn't really matter how many groups. And what you're looking at is comparing how your participants were distributed amongst those groups compared to how you expected them to be distributed. Um, the test of independence or test of association has two independent variables. So still having at least two groups for each of those variables, meaning you have a minimum of four groups um, to allow you to make those comparisons. Again, 
looking to see if how people distributed amongst those groups is different than what you expected, um, indicating that they are in fact related or are not related. Thank you, Rachel. And um, while I, we, we have about one, one minute, so I'm gonna ask this question and then we'll wrap up after that. Okay. Is multiple linear regression the best way to look at the interaction between two predictor variables on the outcome variable? For example, workload plus conscientiousness positively predicting burnout, for example. If you're specifically trying to predict burnout, then yes, you would want to look at a regression. Um, now, as far as whether or not it's the best, um, probably, but what you really need to ask is it the most appropriate, um, and that's going to take going into those assumptions, so things like levels of measurement and some of those other assumptions we talked about, like multicollinearity and things like that, um, to make sure that that test is appropriate. Um, but yes, if, you're, if your intention is to create a model that allows you to predict some outcome that would lend you to a regression analysis first. Um, so first of all, I want to thank all of our attendees. These, this has been some great questions going on here. Um, Rachel, just we appreciate you so much, your expertise and your commitment to explaining what is oftentimes thought of as a, as a completely different language. <laughs> so we really do appreciate that. And then of course, um, as a follow-up, when I send out this email, I am gonna put a link to the Academic Success um, Coach Calendar. Um, so you can take a look at some of those resources there too as well. And uh, as a reminder in our Skill Up series, we are, our goal is to help provide sessions that help you in your academic journey. So if you need something, or have suggestions of what you might like to see, don't hesitate to reach out to me. Uh, I'm happy to, to continuously try to provide resources that will help you in your journey. So um, until the next time, I hope you all have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Bye everybody. Bye-bye.